Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, to Messiah and Messiah alone, be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 28th day, right, Anna? Yes. Right, David? Yes. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, today is the 28th day of the sixth month of the year 2018. Today, once again, we have gathered in the holy name of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, for our fellowship Friday, we welcome you, our returning fellow brethren, for joining us once again in our fellowship Friday. We thank you so much for worshiping and glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our soul sustainer and our breath giver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We also welcome, if you're joining us for the first time, our dear fellow brethren, we welcome you once again. If you have stumbled onto this video, dear brothers and sisters, that's not an accident or a coincidence. In God's kingdom, there are no accidents, there are no coincidences. You are here by a divine appointment and the Spirit of God to the Messiah has a purpose. And whatsoever that purpose is, Messiah and Messiah alone knows that, dear brothers and sisters, our dear fellow brethren, let the Spirit of God once again work in each one of us so that Messiah's purpose can be accomplished in this fellowship Friday, dear brothers and sisters. Aren't we glad, dear brothers and sisters, that Messiah has given us this divine appointment? God's word says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, that where two or three gather in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a divine appointment, our hamoid, which is the Hebrew word for our appointment. This is our divine appointment every Friday. Messiah has given us. Dear brothers and sisters, when we see the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, excuse me, as the, as the book of Luke starts, as we see Simeon and Anna, how they were waiting for their di divine appointment for decades and decades and decades. Dear brothers and sisters, aren't we blessed that Messiah has given us this divine appointment till the day of rapture, if God willing, this divine appointment every Friday. Dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, that in His presence only there is the fullness of joy. In His presence, in His right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Dear brothers and sisters, however your week has been, however your day has been, however your month has been, the sixth month, dear brothers and sisters, no matter what Messiah says, the Word of God says, that in his presence there is fullness of joy dear brothers and sisters the enemy will stop us the enemy is happy if we are having the form of godliness but really not dwelling in his presence if enemy is happy we are every single day looking for the tangibility of faith rather than walking in faith and not by sight which is second corinthians 5 7 tells us dear brothers and sisters Dear brothers and sisters, every time the enemy gets a chance and, and can make us walk in the flesh and can make us think so that we can delude the word of God, the enemy is happy with that. And dear brothers and sisters, oftentimes the enemy makes us believe that we oftentimes have, we have enough religiosity, we have enough amount of devotional time so that we are good to go to heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, it's not about having a checklist but it's about having a relationship with that one person who died for us while we were ungodly while we were enemy, his enemies while we were sinners while we were helpless romans chapter 5 verses 6 8 and 10 validates that it's all about having a relationship with him dear brothers and sisters how do we have a relationship with god that's a so very important question in these end moments how do we have this how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of god as second peter chapter 3 verses at the end verses 17 or 18 tells that how do we do that how do we grow deeper get to know christ our soul sustainer, our breath giver our soul sustainer our all in all how do we know him better dear brothers and sisters from the periphery it doesn't happen it doesn't happen giving about a couple of hours on Sundays. It won't happen, dear brothers and sisters. It's not designed to be like that. 
It's not designed. We need to. He is a person. We know that the garden tomb is empty. That's the biggest discovery of our life. That the garden tomb is empty. And today if you are a true born again believer. Saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Because this is the worst you are going through. This is the worst. The best is awaiting. We all are heading as true born again believers. To a mega 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 upgrade. Which is beyond any imagination. And that's the time we are waiting for. But dear brothers and sisters, yes, we are waiting for our glorified bodies. As the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 4 verses 16 through 18, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 54, 55 talks about that. But dear brothers and sisters, have we ever focused on the fact that when Romans chapter 8, an astonishing chapter, dear brothers and sisters, every time when you're in your valleys, please get back to Romans chapter 8. Probably pick it up. If you don't have time, pick it up around verse 28 and go till the end. It has about 39 verses. It will be astonishing. You will emerge out to be victorious. Romans chapter 8 tells us that the sufferings of the present is not even worthy to be compared to the glory which will be revealed in each one of us. But dear brothers and sisters, that Romans chapter 8 verse 18 in verse 17 tells us, if we want to be partakers of his glory, and of course I'm paraphrasing, then we need to be partakers of his suffering. James chapter 1 begins with verses 2 through 4 tells us that we need to be rejoicing in our trials and tribulations. How do we do that? In our trials and tribulations, how do we how do we rejoice, dear brothers and sisters? We all find it hard. That's a genuine question. It's not faithlessness to ask such questions. That how do we do that? And that's where it's it comes to growing in the grace and knowledge of Messiah. That's where Paul was trying to tell Timothy that to be strong in the grace of God, dear brothers and sisters, it's all when the grace of God empowers us to do all these things. It's all about having a relationship. The scripture tells us, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, the part of the problem, dear brothers and sisters, is we are having this seeing all around how the deception and the heresies are going around we just see the scriptures being pulled out we talk about word of god but how many of us have known the god of the word that's the key dear brothers and sisters that we can play around with the word of god as we see all the heresies and but the word of God is given to us so that we can know the god of the word because we are creating we see that so many different God, we all name about Jesus Christ, but which Jesus Christ are we talking about? What are his attributes? His attributes are only laid out in the Holy Bible, dear brothers and sisters. Colossians chapter 1, dear brothers and sisters, verses 15 through 15 through 18, I believe. Yes, 15 through 18 tells us about Messiah, about his preeminence, about how he surpasses all others. Let's take a look, quick look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. He is the image. This is we are talking about Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all the creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all the things, that in all things, excuse me, in all things he may have the preeminence, dear brothers and sisters. Oftentimes, Satan has a way to implant thoughts. Whenever we think about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we think about Jesus Christ of Nazareth as that broken carpenter who is hanging on the cross. And he's crying out there. And we just can offer him sympathy, but we forget that that same Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. We forget that by him all things were created. That for him, that for him all, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. Dear brothers and sisters. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not a failure. It was an achievement. It was the biggest ever thing which we can witness. Which we can know of. Which we can think of. Through which we all were redeemed. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Dear brothers and sisters. We need to understand that. 
as we gather in this fellowship, when we have a fellowship together, which is a command in the end moments, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, Paul tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, but to gather together and glorify him. So much the more as we see the day approaching, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's a command to fellowship. And when we fellowship, we walk in the light. We don't walk in the darkness. If we walk in the darkness, then we are not truly really having the fellowship. But all these things happen even after fellowship, having a fellowship or when while we are in the fellowship, there are so many lingering questions. There are so many wandering thoughts. There are so many distractions going around. We need to understand, dear brothers and sisters, that when we worship God, we embrace His attitudes. We see God as omnipresent, present everywhere at once. We see God as omniscient, all-knowing, no matter whatever is going on, Satan is trying to implant, devil is trying to implant in our minds. But God is all-knowing. He knows what exactly is going on. When we worship God, we embrace His attribute of omnipotence. That he is all powerful. He is totally good and totally loving. Worship is not about responsive re readings or singing hymns, dear brothers and sisters. Worship is surrendering ourselves to the power, to the majesty and goodness of our creator. Acknowledging that God is all sovereign. And that acknowledgement is not only, dear brothers and sisters, a head knowledge. But experientially. Even when we don't quite understand the logistics of what God is doing or when we when things are not at all tangible what God is doing and there are so many days we all experience that dear brothers and sisters then we embrace that God is all sovereign Romans 8 28 it is written no matter what today devil tries to put in my head it is written in Romans 8 28 that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are the called according to his mighty purpose it is written that if God is in Romans 8 31 that if God is with us then who can be against us no matter today whatever I am in, it is written, Messiah himself says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and life and that they may have it more abundantly, dear brothers and sisters. These are the promises which we need to hang on to. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I believe Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Dear brothers and sisters, when we surrender ourselves to God in all things, and when we acknowledge His headship, we don't question Him, even, even when our society, even our culture does question. Even when whatever our society or our culture thinks about us, we surrender ourselves, we don't question about God's sovereignty. And dear brothers and sisters, that can only happen when we have an absolute me measuring stick which can guide us and lead us to the absolute truth. That's the part of the problem, dear brothers and sisters. In our society, everything has become relative. I have my own truth, you have your own truth, and that's how it works. Dear brothers and sisters, that's not how it is. That's not how it was supposed to be. We see from our school system how the Bibles have been uprooted from our colleges, our universities, how it, it has become a crime to talk about Christ. And I'm sure, dear brothers and sisters, that's not only in America, it's in all, all parts of the world, it's catching up. I mean, in these end of the end moments, dear brothers and sisters, we see that how we are indeed having all the prophecies which are not very prominent prophecies, that people's love will grow cold. In Matthew chapter 24 verses 11 and 12. We see that coming to pass. Things we see. What Paul was telling to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. Every single of those prophecies are coming to pass. Dear brothers and sisters. We oftentimes we don't get to hear. From this social platform. Or from the pulpits. But it is. That's the part of the problem, dear brothers and sisters, that we all have become having a relative truth. But that's not true because Jesus Christ of Nazareth says he shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And if the truth is relative, then how can we be set free? And that's why, dear brothers and sisters, we need to have an absolute measuring stick which can guide us and lead us to the absolute truth. 
And that measuring stick should be for a true born again believer. It should be the word of God. So dear brothers and sisters, choosing to believe against every odd that God's word is absolutely infallible and inerrant, no matter what it is. That is the key. And against, and again, dear brothers and sisters, just acknowledging it as just, just acknowledge that that won't help dear brothers and sisters. It needs to be acknowledged experientially that in whatever circumstance or situation we are tied up today, right this moment, wherever you are, whatever the circumstances, that in that circumstance, that in whatever the valley be, in that circumstance, completely relying on God's inherent and infallible word for the answers, totally and completely relying on it, is the key, not on our flesh, but on his inherent word, what he said. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the verses 16 through 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for re reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. With any situation, dear brothers and sisters, we face, we always need to have the attitude, let God's word settle it. Let us not let our intellect or our logic, our flesh or our modern society explain away that God, explain away what God says it is true. Dear brothers and sisters, we must every single day dig diligently in the word of God for all of our answered questions, for all of our whatever questions we need, all, all, of, our, all of our, excuse me, all of our unanswered questions and claiming on John 16, 13 when we read, we can take those questions to Messiah that you said, Lord, that you will lead me to absolute truth. And I don't understand what this is. I am confused, Lord. Show me in your word. Help me, Lord, to dig deeper. And he will. That's his promise. We must make a conscious effort in using the inerrant and infallible word of God as the guiding light for our daily lives, dear brothers and sisters. We must be careful to rely solely on the absolute truth as revealed in the word of God and avoiding the traps of devil, this world and our own flesh. As a matter of fact, Messiah says in John chapter 17, verse 17, I believe, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Moreover, we see in Psalm 119 verse 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So today, dear brothers and sisters, let's dig deeper in his word so that our path can be enlightened. So that we can together glorify God. We can honor him. We can together once again glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Yeshua HaMashiach. And before we begin, once again, dear brothers and sisters, let's invite the presence of God. Let's invite the Holy Spirit so that Messiah's mighty will can be accomplished so that we can decrease, he can increase, so that the Messiah's mighty purpose can be accomplished to each one of us. So let's start with a word of prayer. Shall we, David? Yes. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Heavenly Father, as we gather together today, Lord, in your holy name, we stand on your mighty word, mighty promise, Lord. You said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three gather in my name, I will be there in the midst of them, Lord, you said. Father, at this time, we pray that we pray, Lord, please do pour out your spirit on our dear fellow brethren, on our dear brothers and sisters, on each one of us, Lord. And please do give us the love of commitment that Paul had towards his spiritual family, Lord. And please do help us today to keep ourselves into perspective, our flesh into perspective, Lord. Father, please give us the depth of resource, humility, Lord, that we may exhibit and exalt our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. May our prayers, Lord, be a petition for humility rather than a substitute for it. Help us today, Lord, once again, as your word commands us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, to take every thought captive, Lord, and acknowledge our ownership of each negative thoughts and draw us, Lord, to repentance so that we can forgive others where we feel we have been wronged. Heavenly Father, today, once again, please do give us an unending hunger a renewed appetite, a thirst for you and your word and keep us, Lord, free from the bondage of legalism or the false comfort of rules. And also, Father, please today equip us and our dear fellow brethren, our dear brothers and sisters with the full armor for the 
warfare that we are engaged in in these end moments lord and please do help each one of us please do help our dear brothers and sisters today once again to see clearly just where you want each of them to be lord and help us lord help each one of us lord help our dear fellow brethren our dear brothers and sisters to relish the comfort and security that place assures to each one of us father today help us once again to measure everything especially our credentials by the cross of calvary and not by our own flesh May our own resume reflect gold, silver, and precious stones, and not the quest for wood, hay, and stubble. Lord. Help us, Lord, today to focus with a singleness of devotion to our Lord, that we may not be beguiled or blinded by the wiles of the enemy or the glitter of this temporal world. Heavenly Father, today once again, please do keep us diligent toward false teachers and treacherous doctrines, Lord. And yet, Lord, let us never abandon our first love. For we do love you, Father. We can love you because you loved us first, Lord. Today, help us, Lord, to see you even more clearly and thus love you even more, Lord. And Heavenly Father, today as we read the scriptures together with our dear brothers and sisters, with our dear fellow brethren and worship you, Lord. Today, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, our rock, our redeemer, Yeshua HaMashiach. Today, please do open our hearts and lives to your word, Lord, and your word to our hearts and lives. And please do help us to worship you in truth and in spirit. All this we pray in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, the line from the tribe of Judah and the root of David, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen, amen and amen and amen. amen. All right, dear brothers and sisters, today the Lord is leading us to dwell on, to read together Psalm 33, an astonishing psalm. Psalm 33 is an anonym, anonymous psalm, of course. It's a psalm of descriptive praise. It is a call for all the people to join together in praising God and waiting upon Him. What an astonishing time to read this psalm together today dear brothers and sisters so let's jump in psalm 33 we will be using once again our new king james version dear brothers and sisters you can follow along please or you're more than welcome dear brothers and sisters to have you use your own bible with whichever version you're comfortable dear brothers and sisters the whole point is let the spirit of god accomplish his purpose not our flesh so let us decrease let us ask the lord to decrease us so that he can increase and accomplish his purpose so Psalm 33, it has 22 verses and the structure, 22 verses and the structure is basically we can say the first seven verses is a call for righteous to praise God in view of his righteous acts and creation. Verses 8 through 12, we see a call for nations to praise God in view of God's sovereign work in creation. Verses 13 through 19, we see a call for the people to praise God in view of his care of creation. And verses 20 through 22, we see a concluding affirmation of confidence in God. So Psalm 33, once again, dear brothers and sisters, it's an anonymous psalm. The sovereignty of the Lord in creation and history. So let's jump in Psalm, psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Dear brothers and sisters, there itself we need to take a pause and ask ourselves, so the psalmist here says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, dear brothers and sisters. Who is the psalmist referring to? O you righteous, rejoice in the Lord. Let's see who is the righteous. If we are truly born again today, truly born again, saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, I believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he who knew no sin was made sin. That was Messiah we are talking about here. Paul was talking about. So that we can become the righteousness of God. So in a sense, Messiah's righteousness is given to us as a free gift. Now we are called righteous in Messiah. So here is the call. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. We don't stop there. After the righteousness of Messiah is given to us, what is the call for that righteous person to do? Rejoice in the Lord. Today have we rejoiced. Have you rejoiced in the Lord, dear brothers and sisters, in these end moments, whenever, wherever, wherever you are? Rejoicing never goes. We don't have to upgrade on rejoicing. Rejoicing has been there since the world began. Rejoicing in the Lord can never, can never 
go for vain, dear brothers and sisters. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want us to rejoice. Paul says in Philippians, I believe Philippians chapter 3 verse 1, Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 in a book of just four chapters, twice he is repeating and telling us rejoice and rejoice always. Dear brothers and sisters, the enemy doesn't want us to rejoice. The enemy wants us to dwell in our problems. The enemy, as Peter was looking at the storm, he started sinking. The enemy doesn't, when we rejoice, our eyes are not on ourselves, on our strength, on our flesh, on our problems, on our surroundings, on our circumstances. When we rejoice, we look up at the creator of heaven and earth. We look up at our heavenly father. We look up at our redeemer. The one who came down from heaven to earth and paid all the price. And he says, I got this, my son. I got this, my daughter. You don't have to worry. We just need to pray. praise, dear brothers and sisters. We all must remember the battle of Jehoshaphat. If not, dear brothers and sisters, we need to go back and see. We all must remember the, how Joshua fought. The battle of Jericho, dear brothers and sisters. Praise is something which... Gives each one of us, the Bible says, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we rejoice, we become strong. The enemy doesn't want us to be strong. The enemy hates when God is, we rejoice in the Lord. Rejoicing is not for God. Rejoicing is for us to regain that perspective that who we are in Messiah. First, Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 tells us, dear brothers and sisters, that God has provided us all the resources, every tool to lead a life, to fight the devil and fight the flesh, to flee away from our flesh, fight the glitters of this temporal world and lead a godly life which is pleasing to God. Dear brothers and sisters, we don't have to do it in our strength. We just have to look up. We just have to rejoice. He will do it for us. Oftentimes, dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be, the rejoicing doesn't have to be a gathering for 20 people, 30 people, or 100 people, or 500 people. Rejoicing is, we can do it any, any day. As a matter of fact, we should have that every single day. When we have that alone time with Messiah, it may be five minutes. Just one song, just rejoice. Just one song. Just praise Him. How great is our God. You are the name above every single name. You are my Redeemer. You are my rock. You are my shelter, Lord. The Bible says the righteous, you are, your name is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe today. Wherever I am, Lord, today I step out believing your promise that you will guide me whenever I'm stepping out because you are guarding me as your word says in Psalm 21. You keep, um, keep watch over my stepping out and coming back. So I surrender it to you, I commit all my ways to you, Psalm 37, 5, and trust in you as well, Lord. So that according to your mighty will, let it come to pass today. Help me rejoice, Lord. I am heavily burdened. My soul is not letting me, my flesh, my thoughts, my illness, my sickness, my circumstances, my situations are not letting me. Here I am, Lord. You said you are close to the brokenhearted. Here I am. Help me rejoice. And whenever we are here, brothers and sisters, it, all it takes is that conscious effort to just sing one song. And God comes through dear brothers and sisters. Because He is faithful. The Bible says even when we remain faithless, He will be faithful. I believe that's 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13. Although I'm not very sure. But that's where Messiah is telling us that He will be faithful even when we are faithless it's his faith he is able to keep what we have committed to him it's not our faith which will carry us it's his strength his faith his power it's all about him but we need to rejoice in the lord so coming back here the psalmist says rejoice in the lord O righteous for praise from the upright is beautiful your brothers and sisters god sees the praise from the believers as beautiful and continuing, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to Him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. All we need is to shout and tell Him, God, You are the King of Kings. Thank You, Lord, for coming down from heaven to earth. You paid the price. You redeemed me. Lord, I remember that in the book of Revelation when John was taken up. When John was taken up in heaven, when he was near in the throne room, how he was... How he wept convulsively. Think he knew 
that there is when there was nobody when there was nobody to take that scroll the title deed of all how john was panicking john understood and let's thank him lord that when that voice from the 24 the 24 elders when the voice came to john that yes the lamb of god has prevailed jesus christ of nazareth has prevailed no matter what the devil has done the jesus christ of nazareth has prevailed and john chapter 1 verse 5 says no matter what the darkness enemy is trying to today push you into that light will shine through every darkness and the darkness will not comprehend it dear brothers and sisters that's true because his word is true all his promises are yes and amen in him and him alone today is the day come to him dear brothers and sisters cry out to him wherever your valleys are whatever your sickness whatever your ailment whatever your needs whatever your tragedy whatever your whatever the cause that you are bereaved whatever the reason be today cry out to him he has come down and our sins not in part but in whole has been nailed to that cross praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord today is the day today is the day to claim on his promises praise is always directed dear brothers and sisters to one who deserves all the praise and that is who the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Revelation 4.11 reminds us that He and He alone, He and He alone is worthy of all our praises, of all the glory, of all the honor. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We just praise you, Lord. We just praise you, Lord. What an amazing God we serve, dear brothers and sisters. What an amazing God. What an amazing God. It's all going to be worth it, dear brothers and sisters, on that day. It's all going to be worth it. Whatever sacrifices, whatever ailment, whatever your problems you're going through, it's all going to be worth it. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is looking at every single thing. Psalm 56 tells us that all your tears are being stored in a bottle. Now, dear brothers and sisters, we can just get that concept out and tell oh well that probably is he's trying to allegorize it but dear brothers and sisters god says what he means and he means what he says that's a very critical lesson every single day we need to learn what he says in his word he means it that's why he says dear brothers and sisters today is the day when we praise him something happens in each one of us and then the devil has no power. Our flesh has no power. The world has no power. Everything looks so tiny. Because it's not of our power or might. Because it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth's strength. His sacrifice. The final atonement on the cross of Calvary. Dear brothers and sisters. We all are the beneficiaries of the love story. Written in the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. On that wooden cross. Which was erected in Judea some 2000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross made with wood. Yet he made the hill on which it stood. Staggering, 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 dear brothers and sisters. Continuing the, to verse 4. The psalmist says, For the word of the Lord is right. And all his work is done in truth, dear brothers and sisters. That's where we need to take a pause and understand. For the word of the Lord is right. That's where we need to take a pause and understand that we, one of the most astonishing prayer between the father and the son the most in, intimate prayer we see in john chapter 17. there in john chapter 17 verse 17 messiah says that sanctify them with your word and your word your word is truth there is the truth we need to dwell in it we need to dig deeper we don't get our ideas whatever is in our head which is being implanted by in our flesh by the enemy and put it there we read from the text we not read into the text we read from the text there is a difference between exegesis and eisegesis exegesis is trying to understand what god has said in the word and eisegesis is whatever thought has been implanted we are trying to prove it through the bible those are two different paths and dear brothers and sisters we need to understand we see all over the place in this end time in this very social platform from pulpit we see how eisegesis is taking place how our th own thoughts we are implanting and trying to get the word of god to 
prove our intellect and things alike. Wrong, big mistake, wrong, wrong, wrong place. His word is truth. We don't read into it. We read from it. Let the word read us. Let the word tell us what to do. We don't tell the word. Psalm 119 verse 105 as we were talking. That thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. How can our path be enlightened if we are doing eisegesis and reading into the text? We are calling for darkness upon ourselves like that. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Paul tells us about the word of God. The attributes of the word of God. As a matter of fact, dear brothers and sisters, Psalm 119 has a lot to tell about the word of God as well. About his laws, his statutes, his word and every single thing. His precepts. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Tells us for the word of God is living and powerful. Your brothers and sisters, have you experienced that living form of the word of God? Is it living in your life today? That's the question. Is it living for me today? If God said in Psalm 34, 19 that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, the God of the universe will deliver us out of all. Is that living? Have I trusted it? I may have unbelief. I may have trouble to... Trust it. That's why I go to God and say, Lord, this is your promise. I'm having problem. Help me, Lord, to trust it. Never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. It feels sometimes that everything is Jesus Christ of theirs with his absent. But he said it. I don't want my feeling. Doesn't matter. It's his word. His word is living. For the word of God is living and powerful. Are these your experientially you have experienced it? If not, today is the day to take it to your prayer closet. At his own time, God will, if you are seeking him in truth, in spirit, he will show that to you, dear brothers and sisters. The, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of what? Of soul and spirit. We need to understand once again soul and spirit. What does that mean? What is our architecture of our body? Of what is our make? How is, is that anything to do with the architecture of the temple? The blueprint which Moses got of the tabernacle. Has that anything to do with the tabernacle or the blueprint of the Solomon's temple? Has that anything to do with our mind, soul, spirit and body? Those are things which we need to dwell into dear brothers and sisters rather than polluting and contaminating our minds with things which are all wood, hay and stubble. Only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed. Messiah said to Mary of Bethany when he was visiting them. When Martha was busy in the kitchen. So Jesus Christ of Nazareth said only one thing is needed. To cook in the kitchen. No, no, no. That was not what he was telling. It's exactly opposite. To sit at Jesus' feet. To sit at Jesus' feet. And of course I'm being facetious dear brothers and sisters. That for the word of God is living and powerful. And sharper than any two edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Dear brothers and sisters we talk about discernment. Here is a clear cut how we can discern. How can we discern between what's. From the Lord and what is not. Here it is. The word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In, intents of the heart. Excuse me. That's what it is. It's the word of God which tells us. Not how I feel. Not what I hear. What I see. It's the word of God. We need to live on it. For man does not live by bread alone. But by every word of God. Which comes out of the mouth of Messiah. That's how he fought Satan, Messiah, when he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights, dear brothers and sisters. So continuing to verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, dear brothers and sisters. He loves righteousness and justice. Let's take a pause here and... Let's try to understand what does it mean by God loves righteousness and justice. Is that just an Old Testament phenomena? It's just sealed. It's done with. The God loves righteousness. Now we are given Christ's righteousness. So we are righteous, declared righteous. 
then that's it or is there more to it? Is that only something which was the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, who were preaching or is it more to it? There is even in the New Testament we hear about. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2 verses 28 through 29. And now little children, John says, and now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And he continues to verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Your brothers and sisters, these are words, inerrant and infallible word of God. Every single alphabet is God breathed. If you know that he is righteous, we are talking, John is telling, if you know that God, Messiah is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And that's what is the sanctification ministry of the Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit, which the Lord is laying on each one of our hearts on this channel, dear brothers and sisters, to talk. We pretty much talk about that on almost every single video. That's what the Lord has laid on our hearts to talk about. Continuing, let's see in chapter 3 as well. First John chapter 3, maybe about, let's read about three verses perhaps. First John chapter 3, let's pick it up about 7 and go through about 10. So first John chapter 3 verse 7 tells us, Little children, let no one deceive you. Oh, he's talking to little children. I'm now about 40, 50. I'm not little, so that's not for me. Let's not worry about it. Dear brothers and sisters, like once again, I'm being facetious, but we need to understand that we are all addressed here. John is telling us that little children, let no one deceive you. That's a warning when Messiah says, let no one deceive you. Underline those things, dear brothers and sisters. If the Lord leads you, pray over it. There are so many of those warnings when Messiah himself starts the all the discourse. We see Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples the inner circle coming and asking Peter, James and John coming and asking alright Lord then what will be the end um, what will be the signs of your second coming and he says before he says about all the signs and which we get into verse 4 says that let no one deceive you these are let no one deceive you when the Bible tells us we need to underline those and read what are the things because followed by that will be the deceptions which will be happening, which is happening. We need to figure those out through the word of God. It's not our thoughts or conjectures. Our heart is incurably wicked. Deceitful Jeremiah 17 9. That's not my thought. Jeremiah 17 9. Please do check it out. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The world says, believe in yourself, believe in your heart. Trash it, nonsense it is. The world says that God help those who help themselves. I am here to help God. I have the audacity. It's nonsense. We always have to go against the flow because we are not of the world. First book of First John nails that point. Messiah himself in the book of John tells us, the world will not like us. We are not of the world. We are called out of the world. So we don't follow those things that believe in yourself. Believe in what your heart says. God help those who help themselves. Those are all nonsense. That's just setting us up against God. And Satan has a lot of fun when we give in to all those things. Dear brothers and sisters, today is the day to underline. Dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please take it to your prayer closet. If the Lord leads you to a study of underlining the places where... Let no one deceive you. This is very easy to do it if you have the pocket sword or whatever software you're using or if you're using the Bible app, you can do it through the Strong's Concordance. However, the modes and means we have enough God has provided us. It has been made so much easier than what it was last 50 years ago. But dear brothers and sisters, how much are we dwelling in it? Today, if the Lord leads you to understand and underline the places where in the Bible it says, let no one deceive you, please do go for it and read the following verses. What are the deception about? And see for right this moment if that is happening through YouTube, through Facebook, through the pulpits, wherever you see throughout society, wherever do you see that or not. And please do make a note of it. That is how we will know about deception. So John says here, 1 John chapter 3 verse 7. 
I believe. Yes, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Dear brothers and sisters, we see this grace and law thing going on and on and on and legalism going on and on. We don't understand one point that God says in the book of Ephesians, same place where we talk about in chapter 2, where we talk about that we have been saved by grace through faith in the same chapter. The chapter starts with that we were dead in our trespasses and we God made us alive. Where can a dead person put any, make any effort to be alive? Does that make any sense even in whatever logic or intellect we are using? Can a dead person without any external input, can he or she be alive? It's just a distraction put in our path, dear brothers and sisters. Because John says here, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practice righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. This has nothing to do with works. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose of the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Dear brothers and sisters, we need to take these passages to our heart. We need to take it to our prayer closet. We need to dwell on it. We need to spend months, weeks, months on this and to understand. Lord, how is it, how is it possible that you're telling that he who sins of the devil because I keep on sinning? And yes, we occasionally fall for sin. Here God is talking about the sin nature. We don't every single day keep doing the same sin and say that I am saved by grace. That's why God came. That's not what John is telling us. John is telling us that little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as God is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Dear brothers and sisters, once again, please don't get us wrong. We are talking here about the power of Christ, which not only when John, as a matter of fact, John the Baptist introduces Christ. What does he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have we noticed the singular singularity of that sin do we have only one sin in the world why is john the baptist telling behold the lamb of the god behold the lamb of god who takes who taketh away the sin of the world why is it not sins and why is it sin your brothers and sisters those are the hidden gems that's what proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 tells us that there are so many hidden gems in the bible which we need to dig into and understand there we are not talking about sins in the sense what numbering the sins we are talking the sin nature psalm 51 5 we were brought forth in iniquity and jesus christ of nazareth has died not only to pay for the sins but our sin nature has gone now so yes in our flesh we will sin we will occasionally fall but we won't sin can't reign in us anymore romans chapter 6 the other day we were doing the study as the lord led it was when our nine-year-old daughter Anna, she got the urgent word, we were talking about that. Sin can't reign in us anymore. If somebody is, we are staying in that sin, it's not, it's from the devil. Dear brothers and sisters, please do email us. We will leave some links about grace and redemption and salvation. Please take a look at that. Please try to understand what it is. Please do email us. We will have our email contacts. Let's talk. Let's pray over. Let the spirit, power of the Spirit of God be manifested in your life. Anybody, dear brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with sin, which is happening over and over and over again, and you really want to get out of it, and you are not finding a way today, email us, and more importantly, take it to your prayer closet. Claim on the words which Messiah says, that you have taken away the sin of the world. You have taken away all my sin nature, Lord. I am struggling that I am living in this sin. I am not able to come out of it but I know Lord you have the power and see what Messiah does truly approach him he is for us he's not against us you don't have to rely on this channel on me or any teacher on any pulpit the author of the Bible Holy Spirit himself is available every single minute of our lives as true born again believer we have the indwelling Holy Spirit So John says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose. 
For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil has been destroyed if you're a true born again believer. That's just a lie from the enemy that we will keep on sinning every single day the same sin. That's just a lie from the enemy. We don't have to. Messiah has given us the power. Once again, dear brothers and sisters, please take it to your prayer closet. Please do email us. Let's talk over. Let's pray over once again. Let's ask the Lord what he has. And John says in verse 9, 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. And we are talking about the sin nature here once again. Dear brothers and sisters, we all do sin occasionally. Yes, we fall for that. Because we are still in our flesh. We don't have a glorified body. We are not separated from the presence of sin. But we are given the power. We are given the authority now. To be separated from the power of sin. And that's what is called the sanctification salvation sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit dear brothers and sisters so whoever has been born of god does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of god that's what the bible says if anybody is telling anything else that's not aligning with the word of god that's a lie that's a red flag because the word of god is not telling that and that includes me anybody dear brothers and sisters if it doesn't align with the word of god we definitely want to make sure that we don't dwell on that. And verse 10 says, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So dear brothers and sisters, that's what, let's get back to the psalm. Perhaps we'll never, it will never get over, I guess. So let's get back to the psalms. The psalmist says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, and that's what we were talking about. The New Testament concept of righteousness, as a matter of fact. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, dear brothers and sisters. Although the world we see is filled with evil. And 1 John 5, 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, tells us that it's now under the control of Satan, but not for long, not for long. Messiah is coming, the title deep. He is about to take it. So although the world is filled with evil and with people who have no thought of God, we see in Psalm chapter 14, believers, true born again believers, must look beyond that apparent confusion of the world to see God's goodness. The goodness that manifests itself every time the sun rises, a boat chirps, a boat sings. Out of his goodness, God holds together the earth and provides for the sustenance of all people. And one day, God's goodness will prevail over all evil. Psalm 98 verse 2 tells us that. So continuing to verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Your brothers and sisters here, the reference to God's control of the waters of the sea perhaps has a twofold origin, which we can see in Psalm chapter 24, verse 2, Psalm 93, verses 3 and 4. It grows out of the, of course, the creation story in Genesis 1, in which God brings dry land and from the waters and establishes his place. For the waters that remain. Have we seen Genesis, I believe, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. The idea also grows out of the Canaanite religious ideas. Where we see, for the Canaanites considered the seas as malevolent, as malevolent deities. They were pretty much scared with those things. But the Lord alone, yod he -Wave is alone God. Yeshua HaMashiach, Ruach HaKadish, our Holy Trinity. It's God alone. No power, no matter how evil, is a threat to, no matter how evil, whatever it is, God has conquered every evil. And in Him, we are more than conquerors, dear brothers and sisters. So continuing to verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And that's the same God we serve. If he can 
do those things are problems how tiny it will be it may be mountain to us but how tiny it will be to god that's where the enemy doesn't want us to focus on the mightiness of god because then we will know that we are already more than conquerors that's why he wants us to focus on our problems on ourselves on our flesh your brothers and sisters the word of god the bible presents the fear of the lord as a mark of reverence here the psalmist says let all the earth fear the lord it's a mark of reverence and awe on the part of those who recognize him as lord as we see in psalm 40 verse 3 so that's what we are talking continuing to verse 10 the lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing he makes the plans of the peoples of no effect the counsel of the lord stands forever the plans of his heart to all generations blessed is the nation whose god is the lord the people he has chosen as his own inheritance dear brothers and sisters today if you are saved by the precious blood of jesus christ of nazareth if you are a true born again believer god has a message the psalmist says blessed is the nation whose god is the lord and the people god has chosen as god's own inheritance here blessed is to filled with god's joy to be filled with god's peace we are already blessed if he has chosen us we need to claim it by faith dear brothers and sisters continuing in verse 13 the psalmist says the lord looks from heaven he sees all the sons of men from the place of his dwelling he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth he fashions their hearts individually he considers all their works today his eyes are upon you no king is saved by the multitude of an army a mighty man is not delivered by great strength a horse is a vain hope for safety neither shall it deliver any by its great strength dear brothers and sisters we should not rely on physical strength or material resources so that we can save ourselves salvation belongs to the lord who psalms chapter 3 verse 8 tells us and we should look up to god and god alone for spiritual deliverance and for our physical deliverance and that's we should literally look up experientially that should not be a head knowledge whatever circumstance today it is Take it to the Lord. Cry out to Him. Get on your knees and see what God has for you. He has something which is beyond your imagination. Hey, He has something. It is so magnificent that it's beyond any human imagination, dear brothers and sisters. That's what God does. It may not work at our own timing. It always works at His own timing, hey, because His timing is perfect. Here the psalmist says, "A horse is a vain hope for safety." What do we see when the Israelites, when they were saved? What happened? Pharaoh came in the chariots of horses. Who was saved? What happened to the chariots and horses? And we all know the story. That is vain strength. Let's put our hope in God and God alone, and not the God which we have created in our thoughts, but the God which the Bible tells us. from the word of god let's today once again tell ourselves from the word of god let us try to know the god of the word his attributes and the psalmist continues behold the eye of the lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his mercy you brothers and sisters this behold the eye of the lord is on those who fear him What does that mean to fear the Lord? We talked about the awe and reverence, but we also see in Proverbs chapter eight verse thirteen, it tells us the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Dear brothers and sisters, I repeat, Proverbs chapter eight verse thirteen defines for us what is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's not a conjecture or speculation on our behalf. Proverbs chapter eight verse thirteen. So basically we see evil is everything which is said and done which doesn't align with the word of God which doesn't line up with the word of God and that can include anything dear brothers and sisters that 
We will leave up to you, dear brothers and sisters, to take it to your prayer closet and understand that everything which doesn't align with the word of God is evil. And if we have the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is to hate. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Are you hating evil? Because those who fear the Lord, there are special blessings pronounced all over the scripture. So behold the eye of the Lord, let's continue on verse 18. Behold the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Staggering, staggering, staggering. Dear brothers and sisters, this is particularly a warm image of God's care for his people. We see how God cares for his people when we put his trust in him and him alone. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 through 8 tells us two kinds of people who puts their trust in God and who does not. Who puts their trust in themselves. And that is experientially we need to. We cannot just acknowledge God and try to sort out our problems. It doesn't work like that. And dear brothers and sisters, I tried that. It doesn't help. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't hold water. But God came through. When I cried out to him, God came through, dear brothers and sisters. And it was not me I was looking for, our great shepherd, our good shepherd, my savior, my king. It was he who came looking for me. It is he who will come to you. But you need to cry out to him. You need to get on your knees today, dear brothers and sisters. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 through 8. Let's read that real quick. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Cursed. We are talking about cursing here. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Are you putting your trust in man today? Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Dear brothers and sisters. Here we have to understand that. Yes God. We need to take all our, whatever our heart breaks, our needs, our ailments to God. God will orchestrate through our fellow brethren. That's God's mighty purpose. But we should not look up to man for help, but we should look up to God for help. And then God will orchestrate it, dear brothers and sisters. Because the scripture says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt and in a salt land which is not inhabited. But what happens when we trust in God? Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And that's not it. And whose hope is in the Lord. And what will that be? For he shall be, if you're trusting, if you're trusting in the Lord, we shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That says it all, dear brothers and sisters. And the psalmist once again eh, ends with the call for praise. In verse 20 through 22, let's read that. Our soul waits for the Lord. Is your soul waiting for the Lord today? He is our help and our shield. Is he your help and shield today? For our heart shall rejoice in him. Is, is your heart today rejoicing in him truly in truth and in spirit? Because we have trusted in his holy name. Is the trusting God's holy name experiential living in your life? It's alive in your life. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Dear brothers and sisters, here we see a lot of action verbs going on. We see here our soul waits for the Lord. So we see waiting. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him. We see rejoicing because we have trusted in his holy name. So we see trusting and then we see let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Then we see the fourth action verb which is hoping. Wait, rejoice, trust, and hope. Wait, rejoice, trust, and hope. These are words which we loosely use around, dear brothers and sisters. Here we see also, we are talking about He is our help and shield. Is He your help and shield? We, we are talking about 
then let your mercy O Lord be upon us dear brothers and sisters it's so very crucial to understand these terminologies grace mercy hope as a matter of fact we actually the Lord led our nine-year-old daughter to do a, a booklet on to talk about basically grace in which the Lord led me to talk about hope and mercy as well we'll try to leave a link for that dear brothers and sisters since we are running out of time so you can take a look pray over and if the Lord leads to understand what is grace what is mercy what is hope these sound confusing with especially in our jargon those are all contaminated and polluted that's not what the Bible tells us what exactly hope is our hope is sure so here basically dear brothers and sisters we will recommend you at this point wait rejoice hope trust to please do a word study on those we will give you some scriptures if the lord leads you please do a word study on that for waiting we see isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For rejoice, we see Paul tells us in Philippians 3 1. And these are scriptures you can use as a springboard to start the word study, dear brothers and sisters, for the four words, the action verbs given in Psalm chapter 33, the last three verses. Wait, rejoice, trust, and hope. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul tells us, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious for you, but for you it is safe. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, again Paul tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Nehemiah 8, 10 tells us, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For trust, we see Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and Psalm chapter 37 verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Psalm chapter 37 verse 5 tells us, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He shall bring it to pass. And the final word, hope, the starting scripture you can use for a word study will be perhaps Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14 where we talk about a blessed hope. We all have read about it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Praise God. Praise God, praise God. So dear brothers and sisters, today as Anna and David sings for us, once again, today Anna has a cover sheet for us, our nine-year-old daughter. That's the cover sheet we see on screen, As the Deer. As Anna and David sings for us, we'll use the karaoke for the As the Deer painted. So dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you please let's once again together glorify him let's let these let psalm 23 resonate in us and let us if the lord leads us let's start doing the word study for those action verbs as the lord leads you and you can go ahead please Anna and david hallelujah we just praise you lord we just thank you lord hallelujah. join us dear brothers and sisters
glory, 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 glory to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one name, dear brothers and sisters, the one name which has changed our lives forever and ever. The one name which has changed our lives forever. Hallelujah. We just praise you, Lord. You alone are our heart's desire. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to delight in you, Lord, so that you can make our heart's desire, which is your desire, Lord. Help us, Lord, today once again to love you with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our soul, with all our being, with every single cell of our body. Help us, Lord. Help our dear fellow brethren today once again to commit all their ways unto thy hands, Father. And to also trust in you, Lord, so that according to your mighty will, according to your magnificent plan, Lord, you will make it come to pass, Lord. Help us, Lord, to trust in you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to believe you that you are always for us. You were for us. You are for us and you will be for us. And help us to realize that how holy you are, how righteous you are, how just you are and how unholy, how unrighteous, how filthy I am, how we are, Lord. But you still came, Lord. You came in our lives. And you paid the price. Tetelestai. You paid it in full. It is finished. It is finished. And it is finished indeed, dear brothers and sisters. We thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters, for worshipping with us. Once again, if you have not gotten a chance, dear brothers and sisters, to worship with us, please do once again. If you have not felt the fullness of joy which Psalm 1611 promises us, if the enemy was distracting you, this was the time to go back and once again read on Psalm 33 together and once again sing with Hannah and David as to make him and him alone as your heart's desire. So that to him and him alone may your spirit yield and not to anything else, not to your flesh, not to our flesh, not to the attacks of the devil, not to this, the glitters of this temporal world. Today is the day. Today is the day. Let us recommit, resubmit our lives so that he can once again use us all for him and his glory. And today let us once again claim on Isaiah chapter 41 10 as we end, dear brothers and sisters. Fear not, Isaiah 41 10. God, God says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, once again for joining us in this Fellowship Friday. It is all, once again, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to worship together the one who gave it all he had, all he had. He died for us while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, while we were helpless, while we were his enemies. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and we once again, if God willing, we hope to meet you once again on next Fellowship Friday, and once again, dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord lives, please do feel free to leave your inputs, your comments, dear brothers and sisters, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. Indeed, we are the same, dear brothers and sisters, like you all. We do have the same struggle, same battle, which we fight together, so let's keep praying for each other, and we do go through all your inputs and comments and emails. We thank you so much, dear brothers and sisters. It does keep us going in this battle in our valleys. We thank you so much. And we are indeed praying for each and every of our fellow brethren. Let's keep praying for each other. And let us glorify him more so ever. So that his holy name be exalted to the highest. And let's end with a word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. You can go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, for this time which you've given us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for all you're doing in our lives, Lord. And bless us as we go forth from here. And bless our viewers, Lord. And fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Anna. And would you like to say a short word of prayer for us as well, David, please? Yes. You can go ahead, please. Lord Jesus, once again I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And now Jesus comes again. Close her to the Holy Spirit, Lord. And Lord Jesus comes again. Help us, Lord, to be in you and under you, Lord. Have this step right from here, Lord. 
and give us the strength to and fill us to the true Holy Spirit and help us Lord, to be in you and in you, Lord. And now Jesus comes again. Help us, Lord, to surrender everything to you and our heart's desires to you, Lord, so that you can make our heart's desires, your heart's desires, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be in you and in you, Lord. And we step out of here, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, David, for praying for us. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for once again joining us in our Fellowship Friday. May the Lord God Almighty bless each one of you in abundance to glorify His holy name. Let's keep praising Him. Let's keep glorifying Him so that His mighty will be accomplished through each one of us. God bless each one of you, our dear fellow brethren, and Shabbat Shalom.